Hello, I'm Pastor Nick Lewis here at First Missionary Baptist Church. I want to thank you for tuning in today. I pray that God will richly bless your heart. Thank you and God bless. Turn to your Bibles to Genesis, the second chapter. Genesis, the second chapter. Genesis chapter number two, and today we are beginning a study on God's blueprints for the family. That is to say, what God designed the family to be. You see, regardless of what you see in the family structures that are around you, or what is popular in the culture, God has a divine plan, and we should desire to hold fast to the perfect plan of God. It's kind of interesting that we're starting this study on the family this morning and my wife is not able to be here. Uh, It's kind of uh, uh, ironic in a sense and just pray for my wife as she's at home with with our baby and my baby has a a fever and uh, she... uh, uh, we think she's just teething, nothing, no flu or anything like that, but uh, uh, she uh, is sc- screaming nonstop, and so just pray for uh, my baby and my wife at home. But the Christian home is the master's workshop where the processes of character molding are silently, lovingly, faithfully, and, excess- and successfully carried on. The reason I believe that this study on the family as God designed it is important today is because the family is being attacked from all angles. We as Christians need to have a firm understanding of what God says about the structure of the family in order that we do not buy into the lies that the devil is throwing at us. You see, the devil understands that if he succeeds in destroying the family unit, he can ultimately tear down a nation and churches in the process. Today we're going to be looking at the starting place for the family unit. We're going to be looking at what God has to say about marriage. And I aim to ask and to answer the question, what is marriage according to God? What is marriage according to God? Uh, Not according to a government, not according to a culture, not according to you, and not according to me, but what is marriage according to the one who designed it in the first place? In Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 24, uh, we see here the Bible says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. Uh, This is the institution of marriage. But before we get into the definition of marriage, uh, I want us to see that biblical marriage is a good thing in the eyes of God. Biblical marriage is a good thing in the eyes of God. Now understand that you hear a lot of jokes about marriage and, uh, you know, and, and some of them are, are true <laughs> uh, and some of them are false. Uh, uh, but understand this is that all joking aside is that marriage is a good thing to God. You see, in God's beautiful creation, the first thing uh, that God said was not good was for man to be alone. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 18, it says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. You read Genesis chapter number 1, and God, uh, He looks at all of His creation and He says, This is good, and this is good, and this is good. And then God looks at the man and sees that there is no help meet for him. There is no companion for him. And God says, It is not good that man should be alone. And so, what is the opposite of not good? Good. (laughs) And so, uh, you literally could read this verse uh, this way, is that God looked at man and said, it is good for man to have someone. It's not good for man to be alone, and so God creates woman. You see, He then sets out to rectify the situation by creating a woman from the side of man. 
In verses 21 and 22, it says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. You see, God rectifies this by creating a woman from the side of man. And it's very important to note that it says that God brought her unto the man. You know that God is only a giver of good gifts? God is only a giver of good gifts. And so you know what? When I wake up and I see my wife there, uh, I have to remind myself uh, that she is a gift from God. Amen? Uh, And can I tell you what? If she's a gift from God uh, and God is only a giver of good gifts, uh, then I have to treat her like a good gift from God. You see, marriage is still a good thing in the eyes of God today. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 4, the Bible says marriage is honorable in all. And the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. In the book of Proverbs uh, chapter 18 and verse 22, this is one that you want to write down and uh, you want to, to remember this verse. It says, whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. You see, marriage is a good thing in the eyes of God. Don't let the world try to confuse you and convince you that marriage is something that is not necessary today uh, or it's something that is old-fashioned. You see, there is an attack on what is called the nuclear family. Uh, Understand that even right now, uh, that that there is a a homosexual minister uh, from England that is coming and he's going to be speaking in two Southern Baptist churches here in the United States. uh, And the conference that he is doing is an attack on the nuclear family. Uh, Literally, uh, what they are trying to promote and the agenda that they're trying to get across uh, is that the nuclear family is something of the past. Uh, And the entire conference that they're having is, is the idea that the nuclear family is an idol of Christianity. Nothing could be further from the truth. You see, with the understanding that marriage is a good thing in the eyes of God, let's look at God's institution and definition of marriage. In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 24, we see God defines uh, His institution and understand that it is His institution. And so God's definition of marriage is this. You see, marriage, according to the Bible, is the uniting of one man and one woman in single exclusive union. It is a covenant, a sacred bond entered into by one man and one woman before God. You see, marriage as intended by God is only between one man and one woman. You see, God, uh, here in Genesis chapter 2, He makes a woman and He brings her to the man. And I want you to to see here that, that God doesn't make another man and bring him to the man. Uh, God, uh, he, he does not make two women. Uh, He makes male and female. He makes this woman from the side of man and He brings uh, her to Him. Uh, As the old expression is, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? You see, marriage as intended by God is meant to be exclusive, meaning uh, that these two individuals will forsake the pursuit of all others and be sexually and emotionally intimate with only each other. You see, Adam's response here in verse number 23, notice his response to the woman. He says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And so here we see uh, Adam's response is she is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. In other words, we are one. Verse 24 shows a declarative statement that they shall be one flesh. It says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. You see, God's plan and purpose is that we only have one sexual partner. 
our spouse. The Bible teaches very plainly that before marriage, we are to abstain from sexual conduct. And after marriage, we are to only have sex with the person that we are married to. You see, marriage, as intended by God, is a covenant and sacred bond entered into by one man and one woman before God. Uh, People need to understand that marriage is no joke. Uh, People view marriage uh, almost in a a comedy-like way in our culture and in our society today. Uh, But we must understand that marriage isn't a joke. Uh, Marriage isn't something to play around with or to mess around with. Understand, marriage is a holy and a sacred thing in the eyes of Almighty God. You see, when people are taking their wedding vows, they are making a covenant before God. A covenant before God. And can I tell you that that covenant before God, it supersedes what government says. It supersedes what culture says. Why? Because, can I, can I share this with you? I don't know if you know this, but God doesn't answer to government. God doesn't answer to culture. And so understand that what God says supersedes all of that. So what are God's reasons for marriage? Uh, Why uh, does God uh, approve of marriage? And and why is marriage so important to God? Why why did He say it's not good for man to be alone? Uh, You see, God, the perfect architect, designed man and woman to complement each other and to be companions of one another. The Bible says here in verse number 20, And Adam gave uh, uh, names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help for him. You see, when I say that they are to complement each other, I'm not talking about uh, things like, You're so beautiful, honey. Or your eyes are so pretty. Although, uh, men, those things are good for us to say, right? Uh, listen, our, our wives need to hear that stuff. I know that, that uh, you know, our natural inclination is, is to be manly, right? And, uh, and to not say those mushy things. But can I tell you what? There's nothing more manly than a man who can say those mushy things to his wife. <laughs> the, uh, so, so here's the thing, is that, uh, that we need to say those things, but when I say uh, that we complement each other, uh, that's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is that God designed us in a way where we are to enhance the other person by filling in the gaps in the areas that they are not as strong. You understand that? You understand that you're not strong in every area of your life? You understand that you have some vulnerabilities. You understand that you have some weaknesses. You understand that you have some blind spots and some soft spots. Uh, And so God can send you a spouse or an individual that can compliment you and help you in those areas where you are weak. Uh, In all areas and walks of life. For example, my wife is very nurturing to my children. While I am a little bit rough around the edges. And I tell you, my wife, uh, she, she does a lot to balance me out, uh, to help me. I, I, sometimes I think God gave me three girls because if I had a boy, he wouldn't survive. And, uh, uh, but my wife, my wife balances me out. Uh, she, she's, she's naturally nurturing, and I praise God for that. Uh, can I tell you what? I praise God for that. She's not just nurturing to my children. Uh, she's nurturing to me. Uh, when I'm sick or I don't feel good, uh, my wife takes care of me. Praise God. Amen. I, uh, men, the worst sick people on the face of the earth, right? Uh, uh, can, can I tell you, not, not just in a, a physical sense or not just the physical side of things, uh, but also, can I tell you what, it helps in serving the Lord. You see, we are to bring each other closer to the Lord. Uh, I have a lot easier time in my, in my life. Uh, there's two main elements or components to our uh, relationship with God on a daily basis, uh, prayer uh, and study of the Word. And, and what I've found in talking with people uh, is, is that individuals... Uh, 
have the tendency to be stronger in one area and weaker in another. Uh, And I can just tell you, for me personally, it's a lot easier for me to study the Word of God. I can sit down and just study and study and study and study. Uh, But I have to consciously make the decision and choice and force myself to pray. Because I naturally lean more towards one. And it's not supposed to be that way. But can I tell you, my wife, it's the the flip side. Uh, For my wife, it it comes natural for her just to pour her heart out to God and just to pray to God. Uh, But it's it's, it's harder for her sometimes to sit down and study the Word of God. And so what happens is that we complement each other uh, and we bring each other to a more balanced relationship with the Lord. And that's what we're supposed to do. Amen? Amen? I praise God for that. Um, uh, not only uh, to complement one another, uh, but to be companions. To be companions. You see, God made this help meet for him so that he would have someone who would help him in all areas of life. And that's what we are to be to each other is that, listen, uh, uh, my wife uh, points me closer to God and I pray to God that I point her closer to God uh, and push her closer to God. uh, And that should be the desire, but not just in a spiritual uh, aspect, but in all manners of life to compliment and to be a companion. God, the perfect architect. He designed man and woman to fit together in a way that not only brings pleasure, but can also produce offspring. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28, this is kind of the bird's eye view, if you would, of the creation. When you read Genesis chapter 1, you kind of see uh, the overhead story of God uh, creating everything. And then in Genesis chapter 2, it kind of goes into more detail as to how he created man and how he created woman. Uh, But in Genesis chapter 1, and I want you to see verse... uh, Let's actually start, let's back up with verse 26, because this is important. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. You see, it is the the design of God for the family to be made up of a man and wife and then children. You see, uh, I want you to think about this with me. What does the family unit or the family structure actually represent? And this will give you an idea of why the devil thinks it's so important to attack it. I want you to think about this with me for a second. What you have in the family structure is you have a man who according to the Word of God is the head, regardless of what culture says. And then after that you have a woman who is equal to the man. Amen? Understand that just because she has a different function and she has a different role does not mean that she is less than the man uh, or, 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 or deserves to be abused in any way uh, or, or anything like that. And in fact, understand this, that, that a man uh, that, that is, has his eyes upon God and has his eyes upon Christ, even though he recognizes and realizes that the Bible declares that he is the head of his home, understand that that is going to cause him to love his wife and to treat her with the utmost respect. But understand that they are still equal. They're still equal. Amen? And then after that, they have children. So you have a man, a woman, and proceeding from them, you have children. Now, I want you to understand this, that that just before this, it said, let us make man in our image. And so within the Godhead, you have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. The Bible says in the book of John. And so understand this, that the family unit, the family structure, in and of itself, it points to and pictures the triune God. And so understand that the devil desires to tear it down and the the devil desires to attack it because it is an affront, an attack on God himself. 
we need to re- remember that and to realize that. And so uh, here's the thing, uh, my, my friends, is that we can't buy into the lies of the devil and believe what the devil would have us uh, to believe. Why? God is the designer, so he makes the rules. God is the designer, so He makes the rules. You see, God is the one who designed marriage, and therefore, He is the one who set the boundaries and the rules into place. We have no right to change what God has set into place. You see, governments can pass laws regarding marriage, but their laws cannot change the mind of God. You see, when God says, I want marriage to be in this way and in this fashion, it doesn't matter what a government says. The only way that is acceptable to God is the way that He designed it to be. Culture does not dictate what God accepts as right and what is wrong. You see, we as Christians need to wake up and stop believing the lies of the world. We need to hold firmly to the Holy Bible, the Word of God, because in it lies the blueprints that God accepts. And so the question is, do you want to be acceptable to men? Do you want to be acceptable to a culture? Or do you want to be acceptable to the God who created everything? You see, if we look at uh, the marriage relationship through the eyes of God, we come to realize that anything outside of God's design is a perversion of God's plan and an attack on His holy institution of marriage. Understand that there's something called polygamy. Polygamy. And understand that within the Bible, there, there are polygamous relationships. I've heard some make a claim that the Bible approves of other forms of marriage because they're listed in the Bible. But we must understand that just because there is something listed in the Bible, uh, it is historical, uh, but that does not mean that God approves of it. So uh, just because something is contained in the Word of God, listing that this is what took place or this is what happened, that doesn't mean that God approves of that. You see, when you read about people in the Bible with multiple wives, it shows the progression of sin in the human race. Why is it listed? Because it's painting the picture of just how sinful man is. Understand that within the pages of the Bible that there are murders that take place, but yet none of us would say that God condones that. Abraham had a child with a woman named Hagar, who was not his wife. In fact, Abraham's wife, Sarah, uh, she told him uh, to have a child with this handmaid. Can I tell you the result of that? That that doesn't mean that God approves of that. The result of it is there's still a war that's taking place uh, in the world today. Uh, There's there's a war uh, in... Jerusalem, amen, and in Israel, uh, and it's even come here to the United States, uh, understand that the Arab nations in the world today are a result of the child that Abraham had with Hagar. You look at a man named Solomon, king of Israel. Uh, He had multiple wives, and uh, you might say, well, there you go. Uh, But understand that that doesn't mean that God approves of it. Uh, In fact, Solomon's multiple wives actually caused his downfall uh, because uh, he began to worship the idols that they worshipped, and it caused him to turn his back on the God uh, of his fathers and caused some problems for him. So understand that just because something's listed doesn't mean uh, that it means that God approves of that. You see, in the New Testament, Jesus Himself confirms that marriage is to be between one man and one woman. In Mark chapter 10, verses 5-9, through it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart He wrote you this precept, but from the beginning... Of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Listen, among the qualifications of a pastor is listed 
that he needs to be a one woman kind of man. First Timothy chapter three and verses one and two. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. You see, the Bible in no way approves of the idea of polygamy because God's design for marriage is for one man and one woman to be united together. Fornication. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, turn over there with me. And I, I want to read this scripture together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. In verse number 18. The Bible says here, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. You see, the Greek word for fornication is the word pornea. Uh, This word does not mean that God does... uh, or excuse me, this word does mean that God does not desire for us to have sex outside of the marriage relationship. But even more than that, it means any sexual activity, including pornography. Uh, pornea is actually the word we get pornography from. God says here, flee it. The phrase here that, uh, that he committeth fornication, sinneth against his own body, shows that sexual perversion is a whole different kind of sin. It means that you are actually hurting your own body, your own self in the process of it. And notice that it says uh, here to flee from it. Have you heard the term fight or flight? Listen, there's, there's some sins that, that, that we fight off, right? Uh, but, but what the Bible says here is that this is not one of those sins that we fight. This is one of those, uh, those sins that we flight from, we run from, we flee, we run the opposite direction. Uh, understand uh, that the human body was created by God to have desire. And so the desire in and of itself is not sinful. God put that desire there. But the, the misappropriation of that desire uh, and, and living your life uh, solely focused and driven by that desire is where you get into problems. I'm reminded of the Old Testament. Uh, Joseph, as he was in Potiphar's house and Potiphar wasn't home and uh, his wife kept antagonizing Joseph and trying to seduce him. And I'm reminded of a, a time the Bible declares that, uh, that Potiphar's wife, she comes and she grabs the coat of, of Joseph. And what did Joseph do? He fought her. No. He ran out the door. He fled. Listen, uh, that, that's what the Scripture says here. Flee fornication. Run away from it. Go in the opposite direction. What about adultery? In Exodus 20 and verse 14, uh, we know it says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you, you in time past that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You see, adultery is the act of a married individual having sex with someone who is not their spouse. And this, again, is a perversion of God's plan. God didn't design us that way. He doesn't desire it to be that way. What about homosexuality? Again, we must understand that regardless of what culture says, God makes the rules. In Leviticus chapter 18, and uh, turn over there with me because I want you to see this. Uh, Leviticus chapter number 18, and the Bible is very clear here, and we'll also look at another passage of Scripture in the New Testament. But the Bible is very clear. It says in Leviticus chapter 18 and verse number 22, it says this, it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is 
abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile their, thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to d- lie down thereto. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation, nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. That the land spew not you out also, when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep mine ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs, which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. You see, here it says that to lie with someone of the same gender is an abomination unto God. The word abomination, it means that it is detestable to God. It literally means that it is a disgusting thing. A homosexuality is a disgusting thing in the eyes of God according to the Bible. And so this is listed as the same as incest and bestiality. Romans chapter 1, turn over there. We read in Romans chapter number 1. And I've heard some say that, well, that was in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Romans chapter number 1. And I want you to begin reading with me at verse number 26. It says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. To do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Uh, I want you to notice several statements here. It it says here that homosexuality is a vile affection. In verse number 26, it says, for this cause, God gave them up to vile affections. Uh, This word vile affection, it means it is disgraceful in the eyes of God. In verses 26 to 27, it also states that it is unnatural. Uh, Let's read that again. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Uh, It goes against nature. You see, God built us to fit together like a puzzle. And when men lie with men, or women lie with women, it goes against the puzzle that God designed. It says in verse 27, the second part of the verse, it says uh, that they are in error. It says that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves, that recompense of their error which was meet. It says that they are given over to a reprobate mind. The word reprobate means not approved or rejected. It means a mind that is corrupt. See, here's the thing. Is that it is a perversion of God's holy plan. 
What about a misuse of gender roles? Back in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, it said, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He him. Male and female created He them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. In chapter 2 of Genesis, verses 21 to 25, again, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. You see, the point is that God created man and God created woman. This means that when someone claims that they have felt they have always been a girl, even though they were born a boy, they are wrong. You see, here is the thing. The heart is deceitfully wicked. And just because you, in a depraved state, feel a certain way, does not mean that it changes the facts. You see, God made you exactly how you are. And to twist that or change that into something you want it to be is a direct attack on the design and plan of God. Before we leave here today, I want us to look at one more passage of Scripture. The book of John, chapter 8. You may be here this morning and maybe you've been involved in one or more of these things that we have seen that the Bible reveals clearly is wrong. See, we need to understand that Jesus offers forgiveness to those who will repent and turn to Him. I understand that some of those things that the Bible makes very clear, that culture tries to make you feel bad about that and and everything else. You turn on almost any television show today, and there's bound to be a homosexual couple on there. They're engrafting that idea that that's okay and that that's normal into our minds, but not only our minds, but the minds of our children. Understand that the Bible is very clear. But God says it's not okay. But here's, here's we read a, a passage of Scripture in John chapter number 8. And I want you to see this. Is that Jesus died on the cross so that all people could be forgiven. So that all people could be forgiven. No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, Jesus died for you. Uh, Jesus desires to save you. And can I tell you that I praise God that I ask Jesus to come into my heart and to be my Savior. But here's the thing that, that we all need to understand here this morning is that all of us needed a Savior just as a homosexual needs a Savior. Just as a drunkard needs a Savior, we need the salvation of God because the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In John chapter number 8, I want you to read this with me. We'll pick up in verse 3. It says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down with his finger. He wrote on the ground and though he, as though he heard them not. 
So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast the stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up Himself and saw none but the woman, He said unto her, Woman, uh, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So here's the thing is that this woman in John chapter 8, this woman is caught in the very act of adultery. Uh, just a side note, uh, where's the man in all this? Where's the man that was caught with her? Amen? Uh, notice uh, there's, there's kind of a double standard there. And they don't bring the man. And they're not accusing the man, but they're accusing this woman. Uh, and so they bring this woman before Jesus uh, in order to what? In order to tempt or to test Jesus. Uh, and so they, they bring this woman and they say that we caught her in the very act. There's no arguing it. There's no trying to explain it away. She's caught right in the middle of it. Most scholars believe, and I kind of believe this too, is that these individuals who are accusing her probably are guilty themselves. But Jesus, I want you to notice this. Uh, Jesus, he makes this statement. He says, he who is without sin, he, he begins to write on the ground. He says, he who is without sin, cast the first stone. Uh, and and, and all, one by one, they all start to go out. They drop their rocks, right? Uh, and they start to leave. They start to exit. Uh, but, but I want you to notice something here. A lot of times people miss this part of the story, that Jesus remains. You see, here's the thing is that Jesus has every right to accuse this woman. And Jesus is sinless. Jesus is perfect. Jesus has never done one thing wrong. And so understand that Jesus would be completely just and completely righteous in picking up a stone and throwing it at this woman. But what we see here is that he gives her forgiveness and he gives her mercy. Now, I want you to understand this, that in no way, see, see a lot of times people misapply this passage. Uh, I've, I've heard, uh, you know, that, that whole group of people that say, don't judge me, judge not lest you be judged yourself, right? Uh, you know, I can do whatever I want and you can't say anything about it. Uh, th- those kind of people, uh, they like to take, try to turn to this passage and say, see, I can do whatever I want. Wrong answer. In no way is this passage teaching that God overlooks Understand that many try to take this passage to show that we should not preach against sin. Because who are we to judge? But in all reality, it should be every Christian's desire. Listen, it should be every Christian's desire to bring those caught in the web of sin to the Lord Jesus Christ where He can deal with their sin. You can't deal with their sin. I can't deal with sin. But understand that our desire should be to bring people to the foot of the cross, the foot of the Savior, where He can deal with their sin. Understand that Jesus is the righteous judge. And here's the thing, is that you will either come to Him here on this earth, where you can find forgiveness and mercy, or you will face Him after this life.
Instead of throwing a stone, he offers her forgiveness and mercy. It says again in verse 10, it says, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. You see, Jesus shows here that he is the one who has the power to grant forgiveness and to give pardon. I'm thankful for that. But I want you to notice the last part. See, this is the part that people like to miss. Repentance is necessary to escape the judgment that is to come upon sin. Repentance is necessary. The last phrase that he says there, he says, Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Uh, most scholars, you know who most scholars believe that this woman is? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Now, who is Mary Magdalene? There's another place in the scripture that says that she was full of seven devils. Understand that Mary Magdalene is the one that you read about in John chapter number 20 that is first at the tomb. In fact, it, it describes this in the book of John chapter uh, 20 and verse number 1. It says, Then came Mary Magdalene while it was yet dark. The sun hadn't even risen yet, and she was there at the tomb. Uh, she was the one uh, who saw the risen Lord. She thought he was the gardener. Uh, and remember uh, what happened when he called her name. He said, Mary. Uh, and she, uh, she wanted to grab him. She wanted to squeeze him uh, because her Savior was alive. See, here's the thing. There's an attitude of repentance, right? Her life was changed. Here's the thing. No matter what you've done in life, if you would repent and turn to Christ, you can be forgiven. No matter what you've done. I remember one time an individual asked me, they said, well, do you think that someone who is a homosexual can be saved? Amen. You see, Jesus died for the homosexual just as Jesus died for the drunkard, just as Jesus died for the murderer, just as Jesus died for you and for me. See, but here's the thing. Is that salvation is dependent upon two things. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Here's the thing that we all have to realize is that all of us have sinned. Every single one of us. There's not one person in this place here this morning that has not sinned. Here's the thing, though is that some of us have asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to be our Savior. Does that make us better than you? Does that make us better than anyone? No, it doesn't. But what it means is that we've found the cure to the disease of sin that we have. We've accepted His way. Here's the thing. I understand that we've talked a lot about, uh, about some things this morning that are kind of heavy, and uh, you know, and, and, and culture is completely opposite of what the Bible teaches on this. And I understand that. Uh, there's some people that would would say, you know what, you're pretty narrow-minded. That's kind of a compliment. Uh, the Bible, Jesus actually said that narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Broad is the way to destruction. But can I tell you that I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. I'm an, I'm an open-minded individual. Uh, my mind is open from Genesis to Revelation. And there's 64 books in between those two books. See, here's the thing is that we as Christians, uh, we need to understand that our worldview, the way that we picture the world, we view the world, we view society and culture and government and every, every aspect of life, has to be filtered through the Word of God. That needs to shape 
and form the way we think about things. Listen, I, I hope you understand that this, this is not a political thing. This is not a political message. This is a biblical message. We need to stand up for the Word of God. Amen? And what the Word of God teaches. Listen, you may be here this morning, and maybe you don't know Christ as your Savior. Maybe you have never asked Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins. Uh, you need to do that this morning. Uh, because regardless of if you have done any of the things that we talked about this morning or mentioned this morning, listen, if you have not accepted Christ, your judgment is the same. Because we've sinned. But here's the thing is that, uh, that we can escape hell and we can be promised heaven if we would ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and to come into our heart and to be our Savior. As the song leader comes forward this morning, we need to understand that the family is being attacked from all angles in the world we live in today. The devil would have us believe all these lies that a world is spewing out. And the first area of attack on the family is the marriage relationship. Let us as God's people never forget that marriage, according to the Bible, is the uniting of one man and one woman in single, exclusive union. It is a covenant, a sacred bond entered into by one man and one woman before God himself. Let us always remember that marriage is a good and holy thing in the eyes of God, and we should view it this way as well. Now let us leave with the understanding that anything outside of God's design for the marriage relationship is a perversion of God's plan and is sinful according to the Word of God. But lastly, let us leave this place knowing that Jesus Christ offers forgiveness and mercy to those who would repent and turn to Him. And so if you have not accepted Christ, do so today. Thank you for listening today. Uh, I pray that God has touched your heart uh, from our ministry here at First Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, if you'd like to hear more sermons from our church, uh, then please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, and also go up and hit the notification bell, and it'll actually send you alerts when we post new things. Uh, again, thanks for listening, and God bless you.